Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning. First and foremost, on behalf of the organizing team, specifically the postgraduate center of the Faculty of Information Management, I would like to thank each and every one of you who has taken your precious time to attend today's webinar. My name is Hussein Hashim and I am from the Faculty of Information Management, University Technology, Technology Mara, or commonly known as UITM. For those who are not familiar with UITM, I can say UITM is the largest university in Malaysia, presently having approximately 160,000 active students comprising undergraduates and postgraduates across the country. And a little bit about the Faculty of Information Management. The faculty was founded in 1968, and this year it is celebrating its 53rd anniversary. Among the major programs offered at the faculty are library management, information systems management, records management, and information content management. Dear participants, the chosen topic for our webinar today is how to manage your PhD journey. And for that, I am delighted to introduce, to introduce Professor Brian Corbett as our guest speaker today. Uh, before we get started, let me share with the participants uh, uh, an overview of uh, Professor Brian Sibi. Uh, Brian Corbett is the full name of our speaker. He is currently a professor emeritus at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, in the College of Business Office. He has been appointed to several very important positions in the world of academia including Professor, Professor Mentor, Deputy Pro-Vice-Chancellor, Pro-Vice-Chancellor, Adjunct Professor, and Visiting Professor, not only at RM, RMIT or within Australia's territory, but also at other higher learning institutions abroad, including the United States of America, New Zealand, and Thailand. Professor Corbett's research interests include information systems modeling, business policy and IT, as well as e-business, e-government, and special information systems. In line with his passion and expertise in the said areas of interest, to date, he has published 10 books, over 200 refereed scholarly articles, several government reports, and many invited lecture papers as a keynote speaker, as well as been given numerous research grants totaling over $500,000. Dear participants, Professor Brian's credentials as our guest speaker today are further enhanced by the fact that he has a wealth of experience supervising and mentoring over 70 postgraduate students towards the completion of their PhD journeys. Therefore, Professor Brian, without any hesitation, is the best person to serve as the mentor for all participants attending this webinar. My fellow friends and participants, you may use the chat space to post your questions and comments at any moment while listening to Prof. Brian, but please keep in mind that they will all be kept until the end of our speaker's presentation when a slot for Q&A will be allocated. Please include your name, faculty, and university along with your inquiries. Without, with that, I will turn this session over to you, Professor Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Hussein. Okay. Uh, Good morning, everybody. I want to I want to take you on a journey. A, a PhD is a really interesting thing because it's it's not. It's not an undergraduate program and you're not 18 years old when you do a PhD. It's something you do when you're mature as an adult. It's something that you do when all of the other things in life become important. So understanding a PhD journey is very different from anything else you, that you want to do. So let me take you on my journey through this. Um, as Hussein said, I, I've completed 77 PhD students. Um, over the last 40 years, and all of them have been different. There's no common thread except that they all passed. That's the common thread. 
So let's let's have a look at what, what we know. And the first thing we know is this, and this is a lovely cartoon because it tells you about the journey of a PhD. And it starts probably at the top and you go through all sorts of things happen to you. You get stuck in problems and then you've got to deal with what we call the literature fog. In this day and age, as, as you all know, as, as information management students, the amount of, of material that is published both online and physically in, and deposited in libraries is just extraordinary. We can't cover it all. Um, I spent to, uh, most of 2019 in London um, trying to understand uh, a particular thing about the way that names were created um, in, in the 19th century. And I was just working in the British Library and every day I kept finding new things that I didn't know existed because I was involved with getting into a book. I would then go and search online and find another book or find a set of documents and it just became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then unfortunately COVID hit, I had to come back to Australia and I'm still not completed that project. And that's also part of a journey of doing research is that there are things happen that we've got no idea are going to happen and they affect us all. And all of you, like me, have been affected by COVID and that's part of the journey as well. And that's one little thing. And there are other things that we can talk about as well, or we will. Then there's you get, you get really depressed with your PhD because you think it's going nowhere, but it is going somewhere. And so you need your supervisor to help you. And then you've got to try and, and get through the difficult parts like climbing mountains and going through revisions and then writing it. And all of these things, one after the other, are, are all a difficult part of the process. But the journeys are always filled with happiness and with trial. So if you think about it as, as both a happy thing and a trial, you can understand it. And I, I thought it, it's really interesting to see what, what people think. This is, this is uh, Pei Yi Wang, um, and she's a PhD student at, at Swinburne University in Melbourne. And she wrote this on a blog in 2020. And I thought it's, it's interesting for us all to consider what she says. The course of my PhD is like the weather patterns in Melbourne. Every day has four seasons always unpredictable, one minute sunny, the next minute gloomy. It never rains when I have my umbrella, yet it rains when I go on a picnic. But I have learned to grab the chance when I can, have a beer when it's clear and have a hot chocolate when it hails. If I get caught in the rain, I dance and enjoy the moment. This is typical of, of the sorts of thoughts that PhD students have. Here are two more. Uh, these are both American thoughts about their PhD journeys. This PhD journey does not have a beginning or an end. It began for me years before I sat at this desk when I first began to write and revel in the power of words on pages. It will not end at submission or graduation. Some parts will weave their way into my work for years and years to come. As research, we might do better to accept and believe that we are always in the middle and can only know from there. I still revisit my PhD, even today, 40 years later, because there are things in it that are interesting, things in it that are stimulating. And then one last one. The doctoral journey is an exciting and challenging experience for students as they progress towards the goal of making a contribution to the body of knowledge. For some students... The journey is a haphazard and chaotic experience, more akin to an intrepid journey, discovery, than planned adventure. For the others, the journey is a logical sequence of carefully coordinated activities. We are all different, and we are all going to deal with the PhD in different ways. But as part of this journey and a part of these trials that we're going to go through, always look for the, for the, the positive side. Um, I, I have watched all 77 of my PhD students 
deal with problems during their PhDs. But always we sit and talk and drink coffee and eat food. And in the process of eating and drinking and talking, we find happiness. And happiness is best described this way, and it's something to consider as you're doing a PhD. Happiness is found on the way, not at the end of the road. So all that journey that you're going to go through in doing a PhD or that you've gone through doing a PhD will create happiness because even though there are pitfalls and even though there are problems and even though there are times when you have got too many articles to read or too much time to spend in the library, it's always happiness. And the way I think about it is that every piece of knowledge that we learn, everything that we see for the first time should produce happiness because it's something we've never known before. And just to end this little introduction, maybe it's not about the happy ending, maybe it's about the story. And PhDs are a story. When you remember when you're an undergraduate student, you do this subject, this subject, this subject, this subject. You usually do three or four in a semester. And at the end of the semester, you do an exam and then you put all the files away and you don't look at that subject again. And then you do the next semester and you do it again. And you do that over and over and over again. And many master's degrees are similar. But in a PhD, it's about writing a story. It's about your story of taking a problem or a question and for three to four years engaging in writing that story and you become the expert. You are the person who knows about it. Let me tell you about some of the lessons I've learned as a supervisor in PhDs and about the journeys of some students. I supervised a student who was in prison. And that's sort of really interesting, isn't it? That you think, well, prisoners don't have the intelligence to be able to do PhDs, but they do. Some of them do. This person was uh, convicted of white collar crime. Um, he embezzled some money. But in the process of going into prison as part of his rehabilitation, he sought out, and uh, sought out myself and the university to see, it was Monash University, to see if he could do a PhD while he was in prison because he knew he was going to be there for at least another four years for the crime he'd committed. And he also knew that he had the capacity through links with the prison school system to be able to investigate a particular issue that he, was, he, he had seen in prisons. And he was wondering, well, has anybody ever studied um, how prisoners learn when they go through a rehabilitation process of, say, start, starting a, um, a technical college course or doing their final year at high school while they're actually in prison? And that's, that's amazing. And that was 40 years ago when, when I did that. Um, I never, ever met this student in the process of supervising his PhD. Uh, I, he was in a different state. He wasn't in Victoria where I was living at the time. He was in New South Wales. I never met him. We didn't have the internet. So whilst you can see me now talking to you and look at the slides that I'm presenting, um, I couldn't do that because there was no internet. I spoke to him a couple of times on the phone, but he passed. You see, anything is possible if you've got positive thinking and you can do it. Then there are the many, many, many students who are sensible. They realise that the PhD is going to be difficult. They realise that, that life will throw challenges at them and the PhD will throw challenges at them, but they just get on with it and just do it. They do all the things that have to be done. They look after their kids. They look after a home. They um, know that they have to travel. They know that they have to read a lot. They just get on with it and just do it. 
And when they need help, they ask for it. That's what I call the sensible PhD. They're the people who are the ones that get through without too much trauma. They look at the positives all the time and just keep it going, despite all of the hassles, despite all of the things that could go wrong. And then there's another PhD student. And let me tell you about this particular person. Um, she was what in English we call a drama queen. And that was that she was unable to take criticism. So when, you, when you're going through a PhD, you, you quite often, in fact, you regularly write. Um, I have a little adage that you might just think in park in the back of your brain that if you write every single day of your PhD, even if it's 100 words, that's not wasted ever. But with this particular student, if myself or the second supervisor ever criticised her work because, A, the English was bad or the idea needed more development or whatever, she would go hysterical. She couldn't take the idea that, that you could be uh, criticised for it. And quite often this would end up in weeping sessions in my office. They would, she, would, she just had no capacity to listen and she had no capacity to accept that, that there were other viewpoints. You don't want to be a drama queen. Luckily there are very few of them, but they do exist. But you can always get over that. Don't become a drama queen. Just become a person who just gets on with it. That's the best way. Then there is the occasional student who's a time waster. Um, this is a story about a person I knew at Monash Uni. Wasn't one of my students, thankfully. But after four years of doing a PhD and meeting once a month with his supervisor, they discovered that after four years, he hadn't even finished a literature review. I don't know what the supervisor was doing through this process, but there was a point where this person had just wasted their time over that period. He had just become bereft of understanding that he actually had to do work all the time. You don't want to be that person. And the last one is a great story. This is a a wonderful young student who was, again, not one of mine, but he was a second language speaker. He was Thai, but he was deaf. And he had this problem of, being, of trying to, to deal with an impediment. I, I know of another student who was blind who completed a PhD as well. But they had this problem of, how do, you, how do you communicate with someone constantly? I had, to, um, I had to think about how you would do this with a, with a person who had an impediment, either a deafness or, or a sight impaired. And you think about you have to change as the supervisor to be able to deal with that. But when they, that you get that relationship right, it works. But there's also another type of deaf student and that's the deaf student who doesn't listen. The one of the reasons you have a supervisor or a, an advisor for a, a PhD is because they can offer you advice about how to do this or what they think of your work or give you some critique back, um, help you solve problems, deal with issues that where you might need time off to do something personal, etc. Some people cannot listen. I, after I retired uh, from full-time work um, about eight years ago, I thought, what would, be, what would be the subject I would introduce to first-year undergraduate students? And the answer came very quickly to me, and it was this. It was that you have to teach people to not only talk and communicate and write, whether it's in English or in Bahasa Malay or whatever, you also need to teach people to listen. You all know people who talk over you as you're, as you're talking. 
They're not listening. You also know people who are distracted while people are talking. Um, they want to read their mobile phones. Uh, it, it's it's almost like in in ten years' time we're going to have a whole generation of people whose heads are down here all the time because all they do is look downwards at their phone all day and all night. They watch TV with their phones. They go to the movies with their phones. They're not listening. That's a really key issue. So here's a bunch of my students. Um, some of you may recognise one of the people in there. Uh, but that's, a, that's a, a, a good thing to look at. Here's a, here's a bunch of my PhD students all graduating. There's two Malaysians, three Malaysians, one from Oman, one from Saudi Arabia, two from Saudi Arabia, one from Egypt, one Thai, that's it. Not bad, huh? And all of those students speak a different first language to me. And all of those students were basically sensible, but they didn't have smooth journeys. One, two, three, four, five of those, those people in that photo had children and a wife or a partner that they had to deal with on a daily basis. One of them was running a business that was worth, uh, had an, uh, a turnover of about two, um, 200 million US dollars per year while he was doing his PhD. One of them was single. One of them was separated from his wife who lived in another country. But yet they all completed they were completed because they were people who just got on with the job and did it and had support from other people. So they didn't fit into the first four here at all, but these are some of the problems that you can also face. There is always the incompetent student. Um, sometimes we find them too late and we have to support them through the process. Um, I, I sometimes wish that we were harder at times on people because we put them through agony because they they just can't do it and they're incompetent. Second language is, is a major issue if you're studying a PhD outside your own first language. But you can get over it. All of those people there who are Arab speakers, Malay speakers, Thai speakers, Chinese speakers, they all wrote their theses in English and they all did it really well. Not easy, but they did it well. Sometimes you get students who are sick. The ill student, um, there's nothing unusual about that. It just happens. It's life. The emotional student I've already talked about, the person who just can't cope emotionally with it, they just need help because most of them can get through Um Sometimes everybody gets emotional, but they get through it in the end. And the best students are, the, are what you should be aiming for as a PhD student, to be the best. You won't be perfect. I'm not perfect. You won't be perfect, but you've just got to be the best. I have a friend in England who's a professor at, in London, and his name is Leslie Wilcox. And... He, he has a view about a PhD because he keeps getting asked, when can I submit my PhD? Um, when do I know whether a PhD is, is ready? And he always just answers with two words, when it's good enough. It's not perfect, never will be perfect, but when it's good enough. And in many cases, it won't even be complete. Uh, that's nothing unusual too. But you just have to accept that that's going to happen. So how do we measure, how do we manage this journey when everybody's journey is different to everybody else? So when I was, I look at the, at that group of my PhD students graduating at a graduation ceremony, I can look at that photo now and I see every one of them had a different journey. Everyone was, had hardships. Every one of them were happy. Look at the smiles on their faces. 
they got through it and they survived it and so did I. And that tells you that that it's 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 part of the journey to to look for the good in it. So how do we manage this? How do you manage the things that go wrong? And you never do what the cartoon shows you. Don't go and stand in the corner. Always be up front. Always look at things from a perspective of what is managing your personal journey. How do you go about it? Management is is defined as directing and controlling to reach a goal. That's directing yourself and controlling yourself as much as you can. Personal management is about directing and controlling yourself and working with others to reach a goal. And the others are your colleagues and the others are your family and the others are your partners and the others are your supervisors and the others are your your academic colleagues in wherever you are, in the workplace, in another university, wherever it is that you are, you've got to manage this personal journey because it's all part of you. You can't go and hide in a corner for four years and come out with a PhD. It doesn't work like that. It's managing you as the person, managing you as the individual who's going through what you're doing. And so when you sit and contemplate and sit at the desk and you scribble on a wall or scribble on a whiteboard or scribble on paper or on your computer, you are interacting the whole time to try and make things work. So first thing, that should say firstly, not firsty. Interesting, didn't pick up the spelling mistake. Do you fit? This is really an interesting problem that a lot of people don't understand is that not everybody should do a PhD because it's not necessarily something that's easy and it's not something that everybody will cope with. And I thought that this quote by Helen Taylor is worth reading and thinking about. Have you always been a sort of a square peg in a round hole? I'm asked earnestly by a fellow PhD candidate in the management discipline one morning. <clears throat> I'm waiting to step into a supervisor meeting, engaging in a little social chit-chat with other students working in our open plan space. I've been sharing my mid-year plan to travel home to the country town where I have family, friends and a dog. The mental struggle to place me in a rural environment must be equal to the labour of forcing a square peg into just such a round hole. <clears throat> I take my square peg status into my meeting, sharing it laughingly with my supervisors as we settle in to discuss the latest draft of my literature review. I've taken no offence. Perhaps I'm even sparkling a little bit with pride in my perceived difference. Maybe square is a complementary shape of peg to be. So are you that person who can think outside the box? Are you that person who can see <clears throat> that doing a PhD is different and it makes you different? You end up with a different title. You're called a doctor. You're a person who's seen by many people as being different, you are super educated. You're in that 1% one, 1 of the population who has the highest qualification that you can get. Does that, do you feel different? But it's partly, it's partly understanding who you are. And you have to remember, sometimes you'll be married to someone who won't have a PhD and is not studying for PhD. Does that make you different to them? How do you deal with that difference? You actually have to understand that. Secondly, to solve your problems, to solve the PhD, you have to make a plan. <clears throat> we know planning is fundamental to everything we do in life. We plan our budgets, we plan our eating, we plan our social life, we plan... Uh, family planning when we're going to have children, 
etc. And a PhD is no different. And there are three little parts to it. Where are we now? Where do we want to be? And how will we get there? So it's an intellectual process that we have to set out. What's the way that we want to get? Where do we want to get to? And part of that process is not physical. Part of that process is in your brain. I don't know how many of you deliberately daydream. Um, daydreaming is that process where you walk around imagining things, what it is that you could be, what it is that you might want to be. Do you imagine when your children are grown up and left home? Do you imagine uh, going to your children's graduation? Do you ever imagine um, what life will be like when you're 70? All of those things are normal. Quite often when we go for a walk or we go for a run to get physical uh, activity of any sort, quite often in that process of doing physical things, we actually imagine things. We dream, if you like. We call it daydreaming. And we call it daydreaming because we are conscious of what we're doing. And a very famous professor in England once said, you become what you dream. You become what you dream. So if you dream as part of your plan to finish the PhD, if you dream as part of your PhD that you want to be a professor in the future, invariably you'll become what you dreamt. If that's what your dream was, you've achieved it. And I think everybody who starts a PhD dreams about the fact that at the end I'm going to be Dr. So-and-so. I have a dream to be doctor. I have a dream to be a professor. And they get there. And part of that process is not just daydreaming it's using the daydream to write down the plan so how are you going to get there so where are we now where do we want to be that's the dream how do we get there what are the steps that we have to take along the way to get there and we write out a little plan or you should write out a plan of some sort third thing you have to do to manage your journey is work with your supervisor and build a relationship with your supervisor. An excellent supervisor is a person who can talk to you, have coffee with you, eat with you, talk about everything outside of your PhD with you as well, talk about kids, talk about family, talk about issues that you have, a, a supervisor with you is there to give you support. And support's not just about the academic support and the critique that you're expecting because your work is doing this and this and this and this, but it's also about trying to understand how your supervisor can be there when you need to talk about something else. At, at the moment, as, as I've just watched some... PhD students try to finish their PhDs during the last 12 months of COVID here in Australia. And it's been horrendously difficult, as I'm sure it is in Malaysia as well for completing PhD students. And they just need the support to say, just keep going, pat on the back, come on, let's go and have a coffee and sit down and talk. Let's get out of the office. Let's get out of the university. Let's sit down and chat and just get through the, the problems associated with, with actually trying to deal with this disease. The second thing your supervisor does is gives you feedback all the time, not just at the end when you write a thesis, but as you're going through. This is my research question, mm, says the supervisor. That's not expressed as clearly as it could be. It's not as precise as it needs to be. Listen to their feedback and then feedback with them. A, a, a supervisor is not a teacher in the sense of telling you what to do. 
A supervisor is the person who's there giving you feedback as part of a two-way communication process because you're a scholar doing a PhD. You're not an undergraduate student who needs to be told what to do. You're a scholar. You're an equal. You're a person who's working together with your supervisor to, to work through it. And the supervisor can then help you with time management. What do I need to do on a daily basis? Right? If you're a full-time 22-year-old PhD student who's not married, probably your life is very simple. You get up in the morning, do what you need to do personally, go to work, go home at 9 o'clock, go to bed, and you just buy your lunch or dinner or whatever along the way. But if you're a married person and you've got a husband and children and you've got a house to look after and you've got to deal with the kids going to sport and the kids going and doing other things, you're constantly in a state of, well, how do I manage my time on a daily basis? How do I fit all these things in that I have to? Well, you just create a chart. Try and work out some system where everybody helps each other through the process. It's not easy, but it's there. So that's the third thing. And the supervisor can be a really important part of that as well. So there are different four different sorts of supervisors. And you can work out what yours is and what you would like because having different supervisors can also be very useful if you look at the type of person you are. If you're a, a bit of a lazy person, um, you might want to, what we say in the bottom right-hand corner there, a directorial supervisor. That is someone who will tell you, look, do A and then B. Right? If, you, if you don't have confidence in what you're doing, you can say, let's do A and let's do B. And the directorial type of supervisor can be really useful for you. There's, there's an, another person who's highly structured as well, which we call a contractual supervisor. That is a person who won't tell you do A or do B, but will have a conversation with you and come up with arranging ways together that you might get through to the point where you are. We call that a contract. And then there is people at the other side of the system who don't need a lot of structure. They're good thinkers. They're willing to do lots of work on their own. They just need guidance. Um, they need sometimes help with, with issues at home or with issues with wedding their personal life with their academic life and working the two things together. That's, we call that a pastoral uh, supervisor. And then there is the, the person who's completely hands-off, who will just let you go and do what you need to do, how you want to do it, and just guide you along when you fall off the track a bit. Um, but the, the, the other interesting thing is that these four types of supervisors might change and your need for them might change as you go through your journey. So at the start, you might need someone who's very, very direct, giving you lots of directions. But as you go through the middle part of your PhD, you want to be just left alone because you feel confident in what you're doing and it's working really well. So we, you go into the laissez-faire mode. And then at the end, you might start to develop contracts with your supervisor about how we might get this thing finished and write the thesis and get it up to where you are. But all of those are just changing parts of a PhD. And the journey from start to end is never the same. For some people, that direction is needed at the beginning. For some people, the direction is needed at the end. So your supervisor has to have all four of those skills. And it's up to you as the student on the journey to ask them for the particular thing that you want at that time of your thesis or your, your developing. So if, if you wanted to graph it um, on the, on the uh, left-hand side axis, you've got competency, there's your autonomous people at the top, and then at the bottom you've got dependent people, and then you've got a hands-on supervisor versus a hands-off supervisor. So you get ways of looking at where you are. You don't want to be a hands-on supervisor 
or have a hands-on supervisor if you're a pretty autonomous person because it'll create conflict. And you don't want to be, if you're a highly dependent student, you don't want a hands-off supervisor because you'll get neglect and it won't work. So you've got to find where are you sitting in here? What do I need? Most students are down here at the start and they move up that as they get closer towards completion and then they go back down again during the writing phase. And supervisors sometimes are like this but mostly are in the middle here trying to give you a balance between control and hands-off. But you've got to figure that out as to what suits you. And that supervision is part of that journey that I described at the beginning. Sometimes it's high and then it gets low, then it gets high, then it gets low. It's never the same story for everybody. I think if I was to map, draw a map like this of every PhD student I'd have, I would have 77 different graphs because the, the journeys that they've been on have always been different. Fourth thing about planning and, and getting your journey right is to think of it as in two ways. There's the long term. The long term is I want to get a PhD. Boom. Great. But that's not a journey that's going to be necessarily easy. You've got to remember that to get there, you're going to have to go in little steps, one bit at a time. And as you go up each little step, you'll get somewhere towards that goal. And sometimes there might even be a step downwards where something goes wrong and that you've got to deal with it. And then you can start the journey up again. But fundamentally, it's a little by, little by, little by, little by process. In the blue box there is something that I always tell PhD students. It takes about a year in a PhD to work out what you're going to do. And then in the red, it takes about another year to collect and analyse the data. And then finally, it takes about another year to write it up. And if you think about those as three medium-sized steps along the way, a year about, it can be longer, sometimes shorter, but rarely, to work out what you're going to do. Then you can take a long time to collect the data because you know the, the, the guys and ladies at the moment who've been trying to do their PhDs in COVID, all of their ability to collect and analyse their data has been affected by whether they can go into a lab, whether they can do face-to-face -face interviews, which they can't, how do they do Zoom interviews, how does that work, um, are they effective? Uh, and these are a challenge that they've never had to confront before. None of us have because we've never had a pandemic like this since, since 19, 1918. So we're all trying to deal with something that we've, we've never experienced before. But if you use those rules, it, it, it fundamentally will help you take the little steps that you need to to get to the top step. It takes about a year to work out what you're doing. It takes about another year or longer to collect the data and analyse it. And then finally, it takes about a year to write it up, not just once, but quite often multiple times. My record as a supervisor for the last chapter is 13 versions. One of my students needed to write the last chapter 13 times because they just couldn't get down on paper what, that, what they were trying to say in that last chapter. When that, last, that final version was completed and that PhD handed in, that PhD went through with no problems whatsoever. But it just took the effort to, to do it. So set small goals on the way. Set small goals. Talk with your supervisor. Achieve the goal. Set new small goals and achieve them. 
there's a wonderful expression, from little things, big things grow. Take small steps, talk with your supervisor, achieve the small step, then move on. Don't try and do, don't try and do two or three steps at once. It just doesn't work and it, it makes life more complicated. And then the most difficult thing of all, stick to the plan. This is really difficult. Really, really difficult. I plan every day. I have a little notepad and I write down all the things I want to do every day. It's a rare day when I get the things done that I want to. Because things happen. You get a telephone call. If you've got kids, you get the school ring up and say, your kid's sick at school. Come and get them. Or there's a road accident out the front of your house. Or the electricity goes off. Or there's a burst water main. Or your partner, husband or wife, um, has a need to, to go to a meeting late. Or something is cancelled. All of those things will get in the road, but try and stick to the plan. That's why it's important to set small goals because small goals are easier to achieve than really, really big, silly goals. Stick to the little goals as, as part of your journey. So what can mess up the PhD plan? There's many, many things that can mess up a PhD plan, but let's have a look at some of them. Overestimating what's required. That is trying to do too much. I would say the most common issue that, that as supervisors we see uh, when people submit um, a proposal for a PhD is quite often there's two or three PhDs in their submission. And you have to say, well, which one of these three PhDs are you actually going to do? because they, they think that they have to do this much to do a PhD when they really have to do this much, much, much smaller. So don't overestimate it. Don't try to make it too big because that won't work. The second thing is underestimating what is required. That is that the topic is too simple or really doesn't challenge um, knowledge, doesn't make a contribution. You don't want that. You want something that will make something obvious. That contribution doesn't have to be ginormous or huge or anything like that. It just has to be an incremental addition to knowledge. The plan can be messed up sometimes if you have a supervisor who doesn't know what's required. And that's quite often just simply because uh, they haven't understood what you want to do or they're not interested in what you want to do or um, they're inexperienced and that sometimes can happen too. But quite often uh, we work in teams of people so it helps. Don't lose contact with your supervisor. Don't be like that Monash student I mentioned to you before who after four years had achieved nothing because he lost contact with his supervisor. The other thing that can mess it up is not having a thesis. That is a position argument. That's why when you write a PhD or you start a PhD, I always ask, what is your research question? Because in, in getting a question, the solution lies in the process of answering it. And that's what a thesis is. What are you arguing? Am I arguing that brown is brown or am I arguing that brown is really probably yellow that's gone faded or something like that? But everybody has to have a position and everybody's positions will be different. If I gave everybody who's watching this the same PhD question and there were 40 people who were actually going to try and answer that question, it would be answered in 40 different ways. And that's what's so wonderful about, about research and so wonderful about being a graduate student is that knowing that what you're going to do is going to be original. 
it's going to be something that no one has done before. So if you start to compare with someone else, that can mess you up. So you've got to be careful. It's your piece of work. It's your thesis. You've got to stick with it. One of the other things that will mess up a PhD plan is taking a new job before you complete or changing a job if you're a part-time student. Any of those things can be a complete distraction to the PhD. But there are others as well. If the plan doesn't work, change the plan, but never the goal. So the goal is always the PhD. To get there, you've got to read a lot, to write a literature review. You've got to have a research question. You've got to have work out how you're going to do your research. You're going to have to then go and collect data. How are you going to collect the data? How are you going to analyse the data? Each of these is a little step along the way to the goal, but each of those little steps along the way might get messed up by something. Be willing to change them. Be willing to work with your supervisor to get each little step in line so that you can get to the next step so that you can reach the goal. And the goal is the doctorate at the end. So here are the 10 biggest struggles that PhD students have in their journeys. The first one is isolation. Don't be alone. Always have a buddy of some sort in your academic journey. You might have a personal, person, personal buddy, which could be your husband or your wife or your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, but don't be alone. Always have someone who you can work with. One of the things that's really interesting these days because of social media is to join a PhD blog. And in the very last slide, I've listed what I think are the four best blogs in the world. Um, one Australian, one English and two Americans uh, blogs, which are fabulous to use um, because you'll get tips You'll, you'll be part of a community. You'll be able to engage in their dialogue. You won't feel isolated. Join a postgraduate group. If there's a postgraduate association, join it. Go to uni if you can. I know everybody's locked away at the moment because of COVID, but keep the communities going. Um, as I said, I, I, I think one of the great great problems that COVID's created is it's it's taken people away from that co college or collegiate atmosphere that normally PhD students have where there is a desk and they can come in. They don't have to come in every day, but they come in often enough so that there's friends and there's groups of friends and they can work together. I, I remember the students at, at, um, at the University of Melbourne, and I think it used to happen at RMIT as well, where... Um, we had a, a fairly large community of Malay, Malaysian students and they quite often would have dinner together perhaps once or twice a week where they'd bring in food and they'd all sit down on the floor or sit down at a table and they would share their food and they share and talk and they tell each other the problems that they were having and they'd work through issues together. They were always very loud and very vocal and they had a great time in doing that. That's really important. And join a social team or join a sports team of some sort, a social group or a sports team. Do something other than your PhD. doesn't matter what it is, but do something else along the process. The second biggest struggle is stress. One of the, the things we've learned a lot about in the last probably 20 years is that mental illness is not uh, something that you have to be embarrassed about. Mental disorders are normal. We, we never think that if you get a physical problem, like you get diabetes or you, get, um, uh, you have heart issues or you have 
uh, oral problems or your hair falls out or whatever. We've always just considered those normal part of life. But we now know that mental illness is exactly the same. It's not something that makes you different or horrible or uh, something you want to lock away. It's very normal to have a mental illness. And we do know from all the research that's been done is that PhD students have high levels of mental disorders. It's very stressful, not all the time, but there are pockets of stress. And for this reason, it's really important to find ways that you can you can get away, get away from the stress, whether it's the ability to walk or talk to yourself or listen to music or play sport or be active or just get away from the, what the problem is. There are always ways of dealing with stress. And if you don't know what they are, there's always support on campus or through your supervisor to be able to deal with that stress. Very, very important. Personal mental health is very important always. And don't think that you're unusual because you are feeling down or depressed or horrible or there's something wrong. There isn't. It is perfectly normal for people to go through this process of feeling unwanted, unwell, uh, of feeling that they need some support. In the modern in the modern day, in a modern day university, realizing that stress is fundamental, a fundamental occurrence is really significant. We know it and we can deal with it and we can help people through it. Um, a friend of mine has a PhD student who's just completed and submitted his PhD. He went back to his home country in Africa um, at the end of 2019 to get married <clears throat> with the intent of coming back to Australia, continuing his PhD and bringing his wife out uh, to join him in Australia. But COVID hit. And from 2019 until today, he has still not seen his wife physically because of COVID. But he's got through that, through a collection of friends and through his supervisor and through working through through the issues. It's really important that you, you understand that. The third biggest struggle for PhD students is conflict with the supervisor. Now, why do you have conflict with the supervisor? Sometimes it's the supervisor's fault. Sometimes it's the student's fault. In most cases, it's because one or the other doesn't listen. Occasionally, there are people who are just horrible. <clears throat> uh, and I've seen that. I've seen people who destroy, uh, supervisors who destroy students or take away a lot of the, the, their feelings of self-worth just by being horrible people. But many cases, the conflict with the supervisor just comes about because someone doesn't listen. And listening skills are really, really important. And to listen to what someone says to you because they're giving you advice, they want you to be successful. So just try that process of listening. It's amazing how, how much that works. The fourth one is sometimes money. And we all understand that. Uh, as I said, doing a PhD is an adult activity. This is not being a student. This is being an adult. And being an adult, you have to have a, if you have a family, you've got to support the family. If you've got a family, uh, you've, got, you've got to provide uh, more than just, you know, the funding for you to do your PhD and the time taken away from work. But there's also issues about uh, how do you pay the fees? There's issues about um, how does that, how does paying those fees affect your capacity as a family to live the way that you want to live? Um, these are funding issues and they're fundamental to dealing with a PhD. And universities have got people there who can help you if that becomes an issue. But always ask. Don't worry about it. The fifth struggle 
Time management. God forbid this is difficult. I'm 72 years old and I still struggle with time management. And I'm pretty good at it. I've learnt little tricks about writing lists. I've learnt tricks about um, using my computer to remind me to do things. I've used tricks about using my mobile phone to send me alarms about when I'm supposed to be somewhere or to do something. And I have a calendar on the wall where I write down all my appointments. I'm really good at it, but I still fail as well. It's really significant to learn to better time manage. You can't control anything outside of your own control. <clears throat> you can't control traffic jams. You can't control power out outlets. We haven't been able to control COVID. But in that process, we can actually learn to get around it, work around it, do things that will help us. One of the other things that you've got to learn as a PhD student is to say no. I don't know what the Malay word for no is, but if there is a word the equivalent of no, learn to use it. Someone will say, can you please do this? No, I can't. Not to be rude, but there are times when you have to say, I don't have time for that. There are times when you have to say, no, we can't do that today. I have to finish this. Learn to say no. Not all the time, but learn to say when it's necessary. Time management. Work-life balance. I think some people think that PhD students have to study all the time, to be in the office all the time, every weekend, to work late every day. You can't do that. If you, if you did that every day, you would go nuts. You wouldn't be healthy. You would certainly increase your stress levels. You would certainly um, fracture personal relationships with people. It's really important to have a fun part of your life as well as the fun part of the PhD. You've got to learn to do things, to go for a drive, to go to a picnic, to um, participate in sport if that's what you want. Go to a social club if that's what you want. Learn to read books other than academic books. Read magazines. Listen to music. If you've got a family, then you've got to spend time with your kids. You've got to spend time with your husband or wife. Do that. You make time to have those things as part of your life. It's called a work-life balance because if your personal life is happy, your PhD will be happy. It may take, mean that your PhD will take a little bit longer, but that doesn't matter. If you've got dependent parents that you have to look after, look after them. That's that's... That will give you satisfaction that, that that's being good. Yes, you'll feel stressed. Oh, goodness, I've got to get to mum and dad. I've got to make sure that they've got A, B and C. I've got to make sure that they've got enough face masks to deal with COVID. Um, and many of you have probably got parents at the moment, older parents at the moment, and you're saying, I'll do the shopping for you and I'll drop your shopping off so you don't have to go to a supermarket. That's all part of life. It's a work-life balance. Keep that as part of what you do as a PhD student. Lack of institutional support can be a problem. Um, I certainly don't think that's the issue with uh, UITM. The, the support facilities are there. But sometimes in other places in the world, sometimes there's not the support that you need. Um, and it can be quite difficult for you as the person who needs help and you can't get it. But if you join social groups, group, groups of PhD students, talk to your supervisor, graduate schools and universities are usually very, very good at providing 
uh, counselling where it's needed and there's probably much more support available than you actually think. So if you need it, ask for it. Don't be, uh, don't be afraid. Um, it's really important that you, that, that you deal with that support if you need it. Lack of personal support. Wow, we need it. One of the best things in, world, in the world is eating. One of the best things in the world is sitting down in social groups and enjoying food and laughter and fun. Friends and partners and etc. Sometimes forget about what the PhD is, but don't lose the fun of their support. Um, but you can you can actually work things through by telling them what's needed. Um, but you, you can work it work it out. One of, the, one of the problems that I've heard many times that PhD students have told me, and they keep getting questions from, from their mother or their father or from their grandparents and saying, when is your PhD going to be finished? And you're like a one year in. They say, well, at least another two or three years. Oh, it seems to take so long because they're used to seeing you as an undergraduate student or as a high school student, then an undergraduate student, and each semester you get a set of exam results and they're happy. But now that's not going to be the case because there is no examination along the way. There is just this thing at the end, which is a thesis and an examination, um, after three or four years. And they sometimes don't understand that. Um, I did notice when I was working on, in, in America on the University of Maryland campus, there was a T-shirt that was available that um, the students would sometimes wear when they were going to get into this situation with grandparents or parents, etc. And in English it used to say, don't ask me about my thesis because they didn't want to get annoyed about it. But get the personal support that you need. If you're married... You need the support of your partner. If you're married and got children, you also need the support of your kids. They can't be perfect. If you've got a two-year-old who's running around nuts and screaming and yelling, you can't stop them. That's what a two-year-old does. Kids cry. Kids have sickness. They have illness. But... You can work together to help. The ninth struggle is concerns about the future. What on earth am I going to do when I finish? Why am I doing a PhD? Is it going to get me a job? I think in Malaysia, you're lucky. You're, you're in that wonderful situation where um, you've got a growing higher education system um, and universities are, are fundamentally part of the economic growth of the country, and that's good. But if you're in America at the moment, you would be really worried about what am I going to do after I finish my PhD? Um, I read in the Chronicle of Higher Education a year ago that at the moment in America, there are 2,000 plus History PhD students, that, sorry, history PhD graduates, they, it means they have their PhD and passed it. 2,000 plus of them who can't get a job. And the answer is, is just simply is that the world has changed in many parts and a discipline like history is no longer as popular as it once was. So there are less jobs available. But in information disciplines... There's lots of jobs available because that's where the future is. Everything is about smart media and information management and information systems and, and records management and doing the things that we need to do with information. So there's lots of jobs. If you were uh, interested in agricultural engineering, there's not a lot of jobs in there as well. So it's, it's a real interesting balance that you have to think about it. I think in the disciplines that most of you are probably in is that that's not going to be as big an issue as it is in other parts of the world. The tenth 
biggest struggle is motivation. How do you keep doing the one thing for three or four years? When you were doing undergraduate higher education, every subject is different from each other subject and each year is different from each other year. So you're constantly learning new things all the time. However, you've got one research question that you're trying to answer in a PhD and you're going to deal with that for three or four years, maybe five years. So how are you going to keep yourself motivated during that process? When things are you know, not going too well, how do you keep the motivation up? One of the things that you can sometimes think about is taking a break. There's nothing wrong with saying, oh, I'm fed up. Everything's going crazy. The kids are driving me mad. My husband should just go away for a week. But the best way to do it is you go away for a week. You have a break. And that three or four days or five days can work miracles in the PhD journey. Right? That's, that's really fundamental. Um, the other thing is to realise achievement. Sometimes we don't actually look at what we've done and think, wow, that's a lot. I've read 200 journal papers. I've really read 200 journal papers. That's incredible. That can motivate you as well because this is something that you say, I've actually done this. I've achieved this. And that can then give you the motivation to work harder and it can actually help you along the process. But there are other struggles. It is not unusual for a woman doing a PhD to have a pregnancy during that period. Remember, this is an adult process. This is not children. These are not older teenagers or young adults. This is normal with adults in their late 20s and early 30s and even older to actually go through the process of having a pregnancy during a PhD. It happens. Just take a break, have the baby, go back to it. It can work, and it has. Um, many times I've seen that work. <clears throat> Sometimes personal illness can strike. You can get a diagnosis that is unexpected, something that um, can affect you personally. It might be yourself, it might be a kid, um, but mostly about yourself, and you have to deal with that. But it doesn't preclude you from doing it. Personal illness is, is something you just have to address. You can have people... Uh, die during the process. It can be a close relative, it can be a grandparents or a parent. You have to get on with dealing with that. You've got to deal with it as you would normally would and then go back to your PhD when you're ready. But don't rush back. When you, you Grieving is not an easy process. You need to be able to, to deal with your, what you need to do and then just do it. Those of you who have children can have a sick kid at times. You can't ignore the sick kid. You'll get the satisfaction out of working through that problem and then onto your PhD without affecting the, the kid in any way. Uh, but if you've got a sick child, you've got a sick child. Unfortunately, sometimes divorce comes in um, where people's relationships break up. You have to deal with those. Sometimes change of location <clears throat> change of supervisor, change of house, change of apartment. All of those things can be difficult. I always feel amazed in Australia when we have people like that were in my photograph before who've come from places like Saudi or Malaysia or Thailand or Oman. Um, I've had students from Palestine. I've had students from Syria. And I've had Americans and Brits and obviously Australians as well as my PhD students. I've had Chinese as well. And in that process, I'm, I'm always amazed at how well they deal with the change of location because they've got to deal with food differences. They've got to deal with being able to bring 
you know, like, for example, um, most of you are um, uh, practice Islam, so you've got to deal with the food issues in a country like Australia, which is has low levels of Islam, uh, Islamic practice, so dealing with halal food is an issue. Um, the, the different customs, and if you've got kids, they're going to go to school and they're going to come home and do things that they would never do in Malaysia, um, but they do here, uh, do in Australia, and just think it's it's perfectly normal. The way that people dress is different. The way that 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 people deal with the, the way that you talk is different. And if any of you ever would go to London at some stage in your life, London's quite straightforward. You can understand everything that people say. But then you might say, oh, let's go for a day trip to Liverpool. Well, going to listen to people who speak English in Liverpool is like going to Thailand for a Malaysian. The language is like totally different and you've got to deal with it. But that change of location is, can cause a struggle from you as a PhD student. War can be a problem for PhD students. Um, I had a, a Palestinian student about 20 years ago and in the middle of his PhD, um, there was a massive outbreak in the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and his parents were affected in Palestine. So that had a big effect on his progress and the way he did it. He dealt with the issue. Um, I helped him through as much as I could. And then when he was satisfied, everything was okay, he then came back to his PhD and moved on. And then finally, for the first time ever in my life, uh, we have this horrific virus, which has affected all of the ways that we talk about virus, uh, um, the way that we do a PhD. In a, in, a, in a former life, and I've been to UITM before to do this, I would probably be doing this face-to-face -face with you. I would be up there on the stage and talking and, walking around and pointing at things and being the crazy person I am. But I can't do that. I'm stuck here in a chair in my living room talking to you through the, the wonders of, of electronics. And this has changed everything. It's changed the way people supervise. It's changed the way people actually communicate with each other. Um, those of you who are married and have got children and you're trying to teach your kids at home because schools are not open and do your PhD, you deserve an honour system for that because that must be so difficult to do. But these are some of the struggles that you have to deal with. And as I, as I work towards the end, here are four wonderful blogs that you as a PhD student, you as a supervisor... Uh, might want to join. I think they're all wonderful. Uh, they're all slightly different from each other. Uh, I'm a member of all four, and I think they're superb. Um, the Thesis Whisperer is run from the Australian National University in Canberra. Um, the Dutch PhD uh, blog is run, obviously, from Holland. Yeah, it's an amazing one. The English one is the Manchester one. Um, Manchester Research Hive um, is just incredible. And you get the British perspective, as you do with the Warwick one. And sorry, I've just, there's a mistake there. That should be .ac.uk at the end. I'll just fix that up and, and send it on later on. Join one of the blogs. They're, they'll just help you through the journey and you'll hear and read what other people are going through and you think, Wow, even in England, they're doing the same thing as I am in Malaysia. I've got the same problems that I have. They, and you can, if you've got problems with how to deal with your kids and a husband or a wife and doing a PhD, someone in there in one of these blogs will have gone through exactly the same process as you and will be able to support you through that process. So if I can take you right back to where we began, and that is to remind you that the PhD is a journey and all journeys are filled with happiness and trials and tribulations, but they're all conquerable. They're all able to be overcome. 
And it's not a straight road. It's a journey around all sorts of environments. You're going to feel overwhelmed. You're going to feel joyous. You're going to feel stressed. You're going to feel worried. But you'll overcome all of them and you'll become a person who learns how to deal with that journey of the PhD. It's never easy, but it's always different. And I know that the joy I see in every one of that 77 PhD students I've had has been enormous. I see people, not my own students, but always my own students, but I've seen many others as well, whose joy is just extraordinary at times during their PhD, whether it's when they write up their first journal paper or conference paper and deliver it somewhere, the joy from travel, the joy from giving a presentation that, um, that will confirm their PhD or the joy of discovering something new is always part of this big, long, windy road that is the PhD. It's not horrendous. It's, it can be enjoyable, but also know that it's going to be different for you, different for me, different for anybody else. And there'll be problems, but your supervisor is there to help you. You need colleagues to help you through it. And you need to go and ask. And most important, most important, PhD student and supervisor must listen to each other. Listening is the greatest art an academic can ever have. The skill of listening is so invaluable. And when you listen to people who have expertise and genius in some cases, you can learn so much from just listening to them and taking on board what they say. Listen, 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 and you'll enjoy the PhD. So... Over to you. Questions? Oh, sharing has been so wonderful for every one of us today. Um, now we have a little more time for Q&A. I was told that there, there are some questions. Okay, okay. That, that, this is the first question from by Nora Lina. Yeah. Okay. How to stay focused and uh, GOT? Yeah? GOT is uh, graded on time. Yeah? Where uh, on the side I am getting tons of works from the working place. It is a kind of pressure situation for us as PhD yeah. students. Yeah. Yeah. I I fully understand. Yeah. I I think what you have to do is. If you're in the workplace and uh, they're putting a lot of pressure on you because they know they've got goals to set, etc., I I, th I think you need to to say and prioritize what can I do and what do I need to do, and work out a list. And if if you get into situations where the workplace is too much and is taking over everything that you do. You, you have to make a choice and, and you, you probably need to have a long talk with your supervisor about what the workplace is making you do. And then if, you, if you're quite happy with <clears throat> the way that your supervisor will help you is then maybe go back into the workplace and talk to your supervisor in the workplace, the person that you report to. There's, there's nothing wrong with having a conversation. <clears throat> If they say that then you have to make a choice, well, then you have to make a choice. But if you don't have the discussion, nothing will happen. So my yeah. advice, firstly, is always talk and always listen. So listening skill is so much important, yeah, Prof? Mm. Not just uh, the ability to talk. <laughs> Okay, uh, another question. Do you have tips uh, to stay motivated in doing PhD? Yeah, I, I think one is uh, you have to like your topic for a start. 
if you if you're not liking your topic, you've chosen badly. I don't know how you can get around that. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is is that is is look at what you've done, what you what you've completed, and say, well, when I did my literature review, what did I find that I didn't know before? Where's that going to take me? What's that going to help me to understand? And I always think that that a PhD is is trying to you're trying to develop an argument. This is what the word thesis means, to develop an argument about something. So you can keep going back to your argument. Am I really on track to say that I can argue that black is black mm-hmm. or that there are 15 things that affect the management of information in, in a little library in the middle of a small village in Sarawak or something like that? Do I have the elements of that argument there? That thinking about what you've done can be the motivation to, to look forward to. I think you can also dream. Dreaming is a motivation. There's nothing wrong with going for a walk and having a daydream about what will be when I finish this thing. Mm. That dream is, is amazing. Um, and it's a great motivator. Mm. The, then there are people who use physical motivation. Physical motivation is, you know, a good drink of coffee with your friends or a good meal with a bunch of people, um, a, you know, a bit of social life. Something like that can be a motivator to because it takes you out of your out of your normal everyday PhD and takes you into doing something very very different. Go to the movies. That can be a good two hours of escape because in a movie theatre, for two hours you're sitting in the dark. No one can see you. It's just you and the screen. Mm. Mm. That can also be a motivator because it gets you out. Mm. The other thing that can motivate you is to, is to offer to talk about things. One of the things that, that we did at Melbourne Uni for a while when we had... Um, some motivation problems with students is we had what we call brown bag lunches. And oh. that's a very Australian thing where people would put their lunch in a brown bag. You can bring it in a plastic box these days. <laughs> um, and you bring it to work and you sit around at lunchtime and mm-hmm. talk about your PhD. Oh, Not social, just talk about your PhD with food. And food has a wonderful effect. And I think people forget sometimes that food is just that thing that universally everybody loves. We like to eat it. We like to smell it. We like to talk about it. I mean, just take durian, for example. Mm. All right? Now, a person like me finds durian offensive. Right? But people in Malaysia love durians. Not everybody, but lots of people do. So if you get a durian and you bring that to lunch and you sit down and talk about your PhD while you're eating a durian, you, you, you're getting stimulus from the durian because of uh, that's the way the fruit works. And it can actually help you to, to, to motivate you to, to think about your PhD. But say the focus is not on the food then for those brown paper lunches. The focus is on your PhD while you are eating. So this, it's just a little trick to trick the brain into being motivated. And the other thing is, and this is a little trick that you can all, everybody can do, even if you've completed a PhD and you're worried about your next publication, write 100 words a day or write a page a day. Even if you never use it, writing a page a day, writing 100 words a day is an achievement. That's a motivation. Okay, any more questions? Okay, uh, this is a question uh, from Muhammad Saiful Rahman. Good morning, Prof. I'm uh, Saiful. Perhaps you can share your point of view on the challenges that normally faced by non-academic people okay, uh, from the industrial background in PhD journey and how to overcome the challenges. Okay, Saiful is from the, the industry. He's not an academician. He is a friend okay. of mine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so I, feel, I understand that. Um, I've had a number of students who come to me from the industry background. One of them was in that, that photograph I've showed you there. 
is a young man in Thailand who was running a factory and owned the factory as well that were building fire engines in Thailand for the Thai fire service. So he was got this business on the side as and came into this process as a non-academic. I presume the same as yourself. It's it's not easy initially because you're constantly being very practical because that's what you are from an industry background. You mm. are automatically seeing, well, will this add to the bottom line? Will this make my job more effective? Will this work um, for uh, my personal life, etc.? One of the ways to think about it, and I don't know, so I thought if, if your PhD is, is in, is, are you doing it in this way? But one of the tricks, like with that Thai PhD student with the fire trucks, is that we actually oriented his PhD to actually study one of the problems that his factory was having mm -hmm. so that he could actually try and solve the problem in that factory with his PhD. So that's one of the ways to do it. I don't don't know how far you are along in the process as to whether you can you can actually engineer it that way. That then mm. makes your PhD very practical because it relates to the work that you do. And if you can do that or manipulate it in that way, that will certainly help you to overcome the problem of being from industry because of the way that you think as practice versus academicians who tend to think in theory and it can actually combine the two very well um, so that was the way that we did it with with that student I've had another student who um, who was a, a nurse and um, they'd been academic in the sense they had a couple of degrees to get to being a, a senior nurse but mm -hmm. we, we oriented uh, his PhD towards um, uh, ho hospital management so that it was part of something he actually understood. And I think that's the easiest way for a non-academic industry person to make mm -hmm. the value out of the PhD. Mm -hmm. Orient it towards your own work and make your, your work the, the focus of the PhD. Mm. Okay. More questions, please? Okay, the, another one from Malia uh, Rahim. Can I have the best tips on how to manage time with study, work, and family? I think you 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 have shared some just now. You can yeah. uh, add up. Yeah, this it's this is never easy, and there's no easy answer to this question. Um, I think what you have to do is if you have a family and you're doing a PhD, and if you have a family, there's a there's a partner involved as well. I think what you have to do is to work out what time of the day is for what purpose. Um, you know, that period from five o'clock in the afternoon till about eight o'clock at night, that's going to be kids and family and food and work, uh, sorry, and home, home studies, homework, whatever it is. You just know that that's what's going to be there all the time. So don't think about your PhD during that time. Your PhD might come in the next three hours or four hours after that. It might be that um, once a week or twice a week, you at 8 o'clock you go to uni, go back to uni or go to the library and, and isolate yourself away from the family to do that. And you obviously have to have that discussion with your partner as well so that you can work through those things. Um, I've seen people who uh, get up early in the morning. They go to bed when the kids go to bed, uh, like at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, and then they get up really early in the morning before the kids and they'll do two or three hours of study or their PhD work or whatever they need to do with the, their PhD before the kids get out of bed and start the normal morning process of food and getting off to school and et cetera, et cetera. There are, there are multiple ways of, of doing that. Uh, I think the most important thing is to just get it organised within the family. It's, it's, you know, it's a three- to four-year commitment, but it can be done. Um, 
it's not going to work all the time and there will be lots of things that will mess it up. But I think you can, you can actually get it done by having allocating times to your kids, allocating times to your family, allocating times to food preparation, et cetera, et cetera, allocating times to your thesis. And, and for most people who are in, obviously in that situation that you just mentioned, um, it's going to be late at night or early in the morning if you've got work during the day. And uh, for three or four years, you just do that. Um, and as long as your supervisor knows all about that, they can also help you through that process. But I think the really important bit of it, the really important bit besides being organised and giving blocks away, is to set small goals. Don't set this one huge goal that I'll have my literature review finished by the end of September. How do I get to the end to that, that literature review at the end of September? What do I need to do this week? What do I need to do next week? What do I need to do the week after? Little bits at a time and help you as well along the way. Hope they help. Okay, uh, another question. I think this is the last one, uh, according to our uh, team, the backstage team. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Mohammad uh, Norazli Bani, yeah? uh, okay, dear respected speaker, how to encourage reading academic materials? Okay, it is very challenging to understand the content. The language uh, level is also high. Yeah, I think uh, uh, it is quite challenging for, for those um, the, who are not from the English-speaking countries, huh? like uh, Malaysia, oh, yeah. Thailand. So on and so forth. Yeah, look, it's it's even difficult for the first language speakers as well. Um, mm. A lot of academic papers are written in uh, very sophisticated language, and it, they are difficult to understand. Part of the problem is that we we try to read too much of a journal paper. The way that that I think about it is that every journal paper has one key idea. Almost every journal paper has one key idea. So what is that one key idea that you're looking for mm. in that paper? Sometimes mm. it's in the introduction. Sometimes mm. it's in the conclusion. And so it's, it's worthwhile with some papers that are very difficult to read, to just read the introduction mm. and the conclusion. <laughs> and if you think that that is really significant to your work, really, really important for your work, then read the rest of it. Okay. But I would guess only one in 10 things you ever pick up are really that important. <clears throat> So I, I would suggest you just change the approach that you use to reading these, these papers. If you think it's really, really important, and again, the supervisor can help you here because they'll look at your topic and they'll look at the paper and they'll look at the idea that's come out of that one paper, then, okay, read that paper in full and spend the extra time involved. But if it's not really important, but that one idea might be very helpful. Just write mm. down the one idea mm. and put the reference down. And you can use that idea in your thesis and you can cite it as something mm. that you've read, but you don't have to punish yourself by trying to read all the rest of it. There's, there's a, another word we use in English called the seminal paper, S-E-M-I-N-A-L. And a seminal paper is rare, but they're usually very highly cited. So when you look up, say, like Google Scholar, and you see all the papers that are on the topic that you're interested in, which ones have got the most citations? If a paper's got 17,000 citations, you know it's very important about that topic because 17,000 other people have thought it's really important. 
So yeah, maybe that's a paper you spend some time on. But if it's only got one citation, just read the introduction and the conclusion. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right? So that's another way of, of getting around this problem of really sophisticated language. But there'll probably be, irrespective of that, there'll probably be 20 to 30 papers only that are really worth reading all the way through. Mm. That's all. The rest of the papers just read the intro and the conclusion. Mm. Okay. That's that's the way that's the way I would suggest you do it, especially if you're a second language speaker. I think very, very uh, interesting uh, tip. Yeah. Uh, oh well, another one, yeah. Uh Tanku Anis Kariha. Uh, kari, uh, kari Hi, Prof. Brian. I am currently waiting for my PhD viva. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, can you give me some tips on how I can do it systematically and successfully? So, yeah, wow. look, that's fantastic that you're at that point. That's brilliant. Well done. Yeah. Um, I think the way I, would, I always like to get people to do the viva is to, uh, firstly, you obviously tell us what the topic is. And then what is my research question? That's the first thing. What is my research question? And why is that research question so important? Where did the problem come from? What's the problem context that made me ask that question in the first place? Okay. And then how did I go about this? So... You, you need to tell me as a member of the audience, what does the literature tell me about my problem, my topic, my question? And you, do, you, you don't do a lots of that, but you do spend, how long are your vivas in Malaysia? An hour or two hours? Yeah, about that. About two, about two hours? You mm -hmm. need to talk for about 15, 20 minutes on the background of your thesis, of what the literature says, so that people understand not only what the problem is and what the question that you're trying to answer, but what have other people said about this problem? So mm. then the third thing you tell me is what's the gap? What's the gap in the literature that you're going to fill up with your research that, that you've done? Mm. Then the fourth thing is you tell me, how did I do the research and why? That is, how did I collect the data? Mm. How did I analyze the data? Mm. Why did I do it that way? Justify your methodology. And then you spend a good amount of time telling me about the results. Mm. What does your data tell me? Tell us. And why is it important that you tell us? Mm. And then the last bit, which would be 15 minutes at the end, is what is my contribution to knowledge? Mm. What is my contribution to practice? Mm. What is my contribution to theory? Mm. And if you do it in those five headings, mm. it, it keeps it simple. And remember, the, you know more about this topic than anybody in the audience, including your supervisors. When, you, when you're doing a PhD viva, you are the expert. Mm. And the people in the audience are expecting you to tell them that mm. you are the expert because it is your question. Mm. You've read the literature. Mm. You've collected the data. You've analysed the data. You've then made three major contributions. Your contribution to knowledge, your contribution to practice, and your contribution to theory. Mm. And if you do it in that way, a viva will always work. Great. Wow. Okay, thank you. I think that is all the, the questions that we uh, have for today's session. Uh, and you have answered them very well, I think. We, we like uh, your answers, your responses. Uh, Prof, I think uh, any last words that you want to share with us before we end this session? I, I think I just go back to what I said before. A PhD will make you special. A PhD is a journey and it's an up and down journey but mm. always look for the good part of it look for the the happiness part of it mm. don't get isolated mm. 
work with your supervisor. Mm. And most important, listen to what people tell you. Mm. If it's your supervisor or it's a piece of journal or if it's something that um, a friend picks up in what's there, always keep a work life balance. Drink lots of coffee, eat lots of food, talk and listen. Mm. Mm. Okay. That's all, Prof. Thank you. Okay, great. I hope great, it's great, useful great. to you all. All right. Okay, I, I will sum up, sum up uh, what you have uh, presented um, uh, with us today. Uh, to us today. Okay, to sum up uh, uh, Prof. Brian's presentation, what I can conclude is Pursuing PhD is an adult activity. It is an adult process. So all of us are mature students. We have family, we have children. Uh, it is uh, an up and down process, as you told us just now. Okay, throughout the process, a PhD journey might not be easy for most of us, but one thing for sure, as you highlighted just now, Prof, uh, it is, uh, this journey is, um, uh, uh, the journey itself is something very much manageable. It can be managed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, above all, as you said, happiness is most crucial uh, beyond other things. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Despite all the trials, uh, the hurdles that we have to face uh, as a PhD student, okay, no matter no matter what we have to go through along the journey, at the end of the day, it turns back to us, the PhD students. Okay, who need to drive ourselves to be on the right track all the time okay, until eventually we will be able to reach at our final de destination. Okay, the most needed PhD or the so-called doctor of philosophy, yeah, the doctor of philosophy. Yep. Okay, my fellow uh, friends and dear participants, okay, Prof. Brian's sharing on uh, our topic, how to manage your PhD training has been very uh, enlightening and meaningful for all of us today. On behalf of the organizing team and the faculty of information management, UITM, I would like to thank Prof. Brian once more. Thank you so much, Prof. Okay, we really hope to see you again at our upcoming events. Okay. Love to. We will be, we, we will keep on inviting you. Yeah. <laughs> that is for sure. okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, before we end the webinar, or for all participants, please record your attendance by filling in the Google form that has been prepared by the organizer. You may find the link to the attendance form in the chat room. Okay, do not miss uh, sharing your correct email address as the certificate of uh, participation will be posted to you via your email soon. Okay, thank you for participating in today's webinar. We hope to see you again next time. Okay, wabillahi taufiq walidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thanks all. Bye-bye.